All right, we'll start getting everyone together here. I know that people are out in the hall. We'll call them back in. We'll go through our answers. <clears throat> welcome back, welcome back. So how did this one feel? Aggressive. Aggressive. Awful. Anyone feel better about this one than the last one? You didn't get to take the last one. So this one felt worse. So this is a great example of what the NPLEX is actually like. There's going to be one portion of the exam, the morning or the afternoon portion, that you feel really confident in. Not 100% confident. It's the NPLEX, but you will feel better about. Like I knew a decent amount of those answers. And then there will be a second portion of the test, either in the morning or in the afternoon, where you're like, I know zero answers, or I know very minimal answers. I had to guess on the majority of those questions, and that's common to feel that way. So I want to set you up. I did not create this test to make you feel that way. That was not my intention. This does have more embryology on it, more um, mechanistic questions, some more heme iron-based questions, some vascular anatomy questions, um, but it was generated in somewhat random fashion. So it was not created as to stump you or to make you feel bad. Uh, but it is a good example of how you will feel on the NPLEX. One part you'll feel good on or okay. The other part you're probably not going to feel great on. And the key is to not let that affect the rest of your test, especially if that's the morning session. If your morning session you don't feel good about, leave, go to do your lunch, meditate, whatever you got to do, forget about it and come back in fresh. Because when you get frustrated and then stop trying to actually use your cognitive skills to get to the best answer, that's when the test defeats you, right? So we don't want that to happen. So we'll go through res the results. It's gonna be a little uh, wonky because I have it up on your screen, but I can't see what's on your screen on my screen when I use a Word doc. So I'll kind of try to make sure I'm going back, to for back and forth and keeping things even. But the first question, <clears throat> this was our 23-year-old uh, female presented with abdominal pain, dark urine, and jaundice. She reports flu-like symptoms. About a month ago, she returned from a trip. She denies receiving any vaccinations before. Urine is positive for bilirubin. Liver function and nucleic acid confirm acute viral hepatitis. So we have that diagnosis. Our first question was asking us about hep B antib antigens and antibodies. So it says, how long after infection are hepatitis B, HBV surface antigen antibodies, so HBS, a, B detected in serum. And the answer is six months, after six months. And that's because HBV surface antigens, it's different than some of the other antibodies. So HBV surface antigen and HBV core antigen antibodies are present acutely. They tend to go away after three to five months. And then you start seeing your HSV, A, Bs appear, your antibodies appear. And what I like to look at is I'm trying to do some memorization here. Where's my, oh, fun. This little picture here I find to be helpful in going through what is happening in acute hep B virus when, in regards to our serology and antibodies. This does come actually clinically in handy. So knowing this actually I've used in clinic. So this is information that would be clinically helpful. But you'll see right after exposure, your first thing that's going to increase is your HB antigen. You're then going to see here, so your HB antigen. Gosh, this is just going to bother me so much. Okay. Your HB antigen is going to increase first. You're also going to have an increase with this red number here, your IgM. Remember, your IgM antibodies are going to increase early in infection. We learned that yesterday. And then your total anti H. BC is going to remain increased, and then your anti-HBS antigen is going to increase later on. And so this, that's what this line is here. This is related to your antigen, so it's going to recover or antibody. So this antibody to the surface antigen is going to increase later down the course. So the key here was to know that initially IG, G, IgM is going to show up first and go away, and then all of your um, antigen is going to show up first and go away. And then your antibody to the antigen will show up later. That's really what they're trying to ask you here. They can ask this in reverse too, right? So which ones are going to show up first onto the scene? And they're looking for you to be able to identify that your IgM will come first, your antigen will come first, and your antibody will come later. 
Then they ask about some Billy Rubin um, questions. So we'll go over and we'll go down to our next page here, maybe. Okay, we are getting there. It's gonna be a struggle. So this one's kind of popped on two pages. So the question you have is about Billy Rubin and how is Billy Rubin made more soluble? So we have the answer here. So glucuronic acid. So if we look at what bilirubin, what happens to bilirubin in its synthesis process, we see that unconjugated bilirubin is created first. It's then moved into the bloodstream and it gets to the liver where it's conjugated by glucuronic acid. And you can see that through its, its enzyme there, which is uridine glucuronal transferase. Glucuronic acid um, allows uh, the the, the unconjugated bilirubin to become conjugated and then move into the gut where it can then bind to our different products of the gut. So like lipids, which can then either be absorbed or excreted. Um, we'll see here that it says two molecules of glucuronic acid are needed to conjugate it. That's fine. That doesn't necessarily matter. If you didn't know it was glucuronic acid, you could say, look through here and say, okay, you have glutathione, you have sulfate, and you have acetyl coenzyme A. Um, I think... You know, how would I answer this question if I didn't know the answer? Glutathione, you know, is more involved in reactive oxygen species. So I haven't heard about anything involving it with bilirubin specifically. So I would get rid of that. Sulfate, um, wouldn't adding a sulfate group wouldn't necessarily make anything more uh, absorbable. So maybe that's how I would walk out of a sulfate. And then coenzyme A, we know coenzyme A is involved in a lot of different biochemical reactions and biochemical processes, and we haven't heard it be involved in bilirubin synthesis. So that's maybe where I'd logically go if I wasn't sure it was glucuronic, glucuronic acid, um, but now you know, right? And so a part of it is just getting to, down to that 50% answer. The next two questions, I'll be able to pop up here at the same time, I think. And I zoomed in because I know last time online it was kind of small, so that's why we were super zoomed in. This next one's an odd, like kind of obvious. You do need to know your differences between A, B, C, D, and E. So it asks, which of the following hepatitis viruses is not most commonly spread via parenteral? So um, blood transmission. And so you're looking for the ones that are spread fecal oral, which is A and E. And so that's what I was looking for there. Is did you know that A and E are different, are spread different than B, C, and D? If you knew that, great. If you didn't, again, now you know. So then conjugated bilirubin, another bilirubin question is created by what family of enzymes? So if you got the first question right, if you knew it was glucuronic acid, you could actually find this answer here because there's only one answer that has glucuronic in it. And it's answer D, uridine diphospho glucuronic glucurosynthyl transferases. Now also, if you didn't know the answer to glucuronic acid up top, you could go down here and you would have two options that are included in both, your glutathione, and your glucuronic acid. So that can narrow it down then to two options out of the four, because you're seeing there's a repeat kind of scheme here, right? Cytochrome 1A and 1A2, we didn't see that up top. And then Billy Verdon reductase, we didn't see that up top either. So you're left with these two options. We can see it's the same picture here. You have your uridine glucuronal transferase. So that's that enzyme they're referring to. But again, if you didn't know it, you could at least get down to two options between glutathione and glucuronic acid by looking at these two questions. NPLEX does this a lot. They'll have questions that will help you get the answer if you read through them. That's why I say read questions first, question responses next, and then go back and read your vignette last. Because the vignette will often give you the diagnosis, but then you at least know what answers and what questions you're trying to answer, right? And then we get a question about liver anatomy. So we'll go, we'll scroll down here and we'll look at our liver anatomy question. And is it scrolling equally? Okay, good. So we can see here, which of the following statements is correct in regards to our liver anatomy? Is the quadrate lobe located between the left lobe and, lobe and gallbladder? And that is the correct answer. So you do need to know the different lobes of the gallbladder, where they're located, um, where, where the gallbladder is in relationship to them. And so you can see on the picture on your left, on my right, you can see the posterior view of the liver. We can see the caudate process and caudate lobe. And then we can see kind of where that gallbladder is located and that it's located between the left lobe of the liver and our gallbladder. 
left lobe of the liver being here, our caudate lobe here, and then gallbladder over here. Gall liver anatomy is a really easy place for them to ask questions. It's not a bad review, especially if you're good at anatomical structures, just having an idea of where the different lobes are, where the different structures are, and the vasculature. Now we move on to our second vignette, our second case. So we've made it through one. And the answers here are on, the multiple choice answers are on the Moodle page, but they don't have the images on the Moodle page, but I'll upload that like I did last time. Yes. Yeah. The left lobe of the liver. Here, here, caudate lobe of the liver, here, gallbladder, here. Oh, thank you. Well, also, also would remain true, right? Left lobe of the liver, liver quadrate lobe, here, gallbladder, here still would remain true. Thank you. Just not able to read in the morning. Same answer though. That works out. So you see, left liver lobe here, quadrate lobe, gallbladder. Caudate lobes above, so in theory, if you're seeing this one here, gallbladder is located between the left and caudate lobe. I mean, you could probably argue against it because in theory your gallbladder is, sorry, you can't see my pointer. Gallbladder is here, caudate lobe is here. That's kind of in the middle, but it's not directly in the middle. Quadrate is directly in the middle between left quadrate lobe and gallbladder. I bet you would probably argue though, the caudate. So we can maybe get it thrown out. That process of getting questions thrown out though, that's something that you should never have to worry about. That will just happen automatically. The only reason you'd ever be involved is if you didn't pass and you wanted to see your answers and it was like by one question that you didn't pass. That's when that whole thing comes into play. But I would say that's not worth your time because uh, you all are going to pass. So we're not going to worry about that. All right, moving forward. Thank you for keeping me honest. Make sure I'm reading things appropriately. because It's hard bumping back and forth. So our next person is gonna be our 20 year old man who presents with nasal congestion. He's had seasonal allergies since he was a child, managing it with OTC allergy meds. He's been feeling worse over the past couple of days, has some mild sore throat, nonstop sneezing. He's afebrile with clear lungs. Great, okay, so he's relatively stable. So this first question is asking um, an embryology question, which is awesome because we haven't talked much about embryology here in this class. So it says the development of the respiratory tract occurs in five stages. And what week is respiration possible in a fetus? And so they gave you uh, several options, one to three weeks, five to 17 weeks, 16 to 23 weeks, and 24 plus weeks. The key here is not when things are developing or when the respiratory system is fully developed, but when could a fetus actually do respiration on its own outside of mom? That's the key. When that occurs is when alveoli are developed fully and there's surfactant available. So it's going to be your furthest option available to you, which is 24 plus weeks. Now we can see here in this picture between weeks 16 and 36, here's our picture of our respiratory development. Between weeks 16 and 36, a very long window, we are getting full development all the way down to our primitive alveoli, but it isn't until after 24 weeks that that alveoli become potentially functional with some surfactant. So that's why 24 plus weeks is the answer. Um, the 16 to 23 weeks would kind of count in this, in this section here, where we do get your kind of primitive development, but surfactant's not made available. Your weeks um, five through 17, as we can see, week five and week six, we start seeing the differences between um, our lobe development, our lobar development, but we're not actually getting down to the alveoli. And the respiratory tract starts developing really around kind of it's the bronchial divisions are complete around week seven, but we again don't have functional respiration. So that was the key here. They were trying to catch you to say when is the, the lungs fully developed or when do alveoli show up? So many, many people would be pulled away with D 
but it's, it's going to be C because we're looking for when are they functional outside of the womb, right? When is surfactant present? It would be very hard, though, for, as we know, for a 24-year-old uh, or some 24-week-old baby to live outside of the womb, but it's possible um, at that point because you do have alveoli that have some functional capacity. I like pictures like this because they, they help me kind of break this embryology stuff down into something that makes sense, into more sizable chunks. Um, I have a couple of these pictures and available in this answer key. So then this is a question understanding where cells would be located in the respiratory system. So asking in alveolar sacs, what types of cells are there? Alveolar macrophages, goblet cells, type one pneumocytes and type two pneumocytes. The answer is B, goblet cells are not in alveolar sacs. Goblet cells, are mucus secreting, secreting cells, and where would they be located in? In the respiratory system. Our bronchioles are higher up, right? Higher up in our bronchial tree, because we secrete mucus and our cilia are gonna swipe up the mucus and the junk and everything and allow us to make, have a cough, right? And to cough things up and to remove them from that system. So again, if you don't remember what goblet cell is, here's your picture. Our beautiful goblet cells, mucus producing cells, they secrete mucus. They're often ciliated, so then we're able to get things up and out. So it's higher up in the respiratory tract. There's no goblet cells in the alveoli because you don't want mucus in the alveoli. Alveoli is very thin sacs that need to be able to open and close freely and allow for that great gas exchange between the respiratory system and the blood. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, they are all this poorly worded. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you're here for my last week's rant or on Tuesday, but I had many passive aggressive and aggressive aggressive statements next to questions saying this is an awful question. This is poorly worded question. This is a question asking nothing. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, they are written that way. There's some really great questions. You're like, oh, that's a good test question. I mean, you don't think about that during the exam because you're just like, I hate my life. But you think about it later, you're like, that was a really good question. And then there's questions like this where you're like, this could have been worded so much better. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, we do not retain that control. Question writers are all sorts of um, professionals in the field, ranging from NDs to PhDs and MDs and everything in between. Um, and they are typically all different for one case. So one case will be made up of not just one question writer. So the questions even amongst one vignette could, you could have a greatly worded question and a horribly worded question, but that is why some vignettes can help you solve answers because they're written by just different test question askers, right? Um, but they do not relate to themselves. The questions do not relate to each other uh, directly. They're not written by the same person. So then we have an etiology question. So the most common cause of rhinitis, is it bacteria, virus, chemical irritants, or fungi? So if you said viruses, congratulations. If there was um, allergen or allergy on here, I think that would be a, a hard pull away from viruses, right? Rhinitis, allergic rhinitis is relatively common, but it says chemical irritants. So chemical irritants is a less common cause of an, a rhinitis, right? An inflammation of the nose. Bacteria also not common. Um, fungi less common, viruses obviously the most. And adenovirus would be your answer if they ask you what is the most common virus to cause rhinitis, right? So they could have also asked that question and adenovirus would have been your, um, your answer. Then we have down below allergic rhinitis is a prime example of which hypersensitivity immune response, which we talked about yesterday, right? Type one is not only anaphylaxis, but it's also ATP, right? So think about when you have an allergic response, type one is gonna be your friend because type one uses IgE antibodies or immunoglobulins and eosinophils. So it's going to be both anaphylaxis and ATP. We often think and learn type one as, um, as anaphylaxis. So then when we have an ATP question about it. We kind of second guess ourselves. Then we move into a question about um, our 19 year old female with breast tenderness. So it's bilateral, started two years ago, last a couple of days. She noticed that it occurred with her period. So we think, okay, we're gonna get some cyclical questions potentially. Um, most of the time pain's bearable, but in other occasions she, it's, she clears out her schedule. Unremarkable exam of breast. Her cycle is every 29 days with her period lasting five to seven. 
She reports other PMS symptoms like mood swings, increased appetite, and bloating. And I don't know if her multiple appetites, I don't know, it says increased appetite. I thought that was cute. Um, so the first thing is another embryology question. Oh my gosh, they're everywhere. So what, when does the embryo begin to develop? Does the begin to develop female sex characteristics? And so female sex characteristics develop a little bit later than male sex characteristics. So in female sex characteristics begin to develop week seven. Um, primary sex cord develops week five, but no specific genitalia has started to form. So that's why week seven would be your answer. They don't even give you a week five though. So it's nice. They don't confuse you with when does the primary sex cord develop. They say week four, which is too soon. They say seven, which is like when in doubt, week seven is when like a bunch of stuff happens, week seven and eight. So that would be a good estimation if you're not sure. And then week nine and 10 is a little bit later. Yeah. <clears throat> so they don't give you an eight here, which is good. Because like I said, week seven and eight would be like my answer for everything when in doubt. Week nine is a little bit later. So week seven, eight is when that undifferentiated, like that, the undifferentiated gonads starts to form. By week 10, um, that's when you're really seeing full true sex characteristics. It's not in their final mature form, but you can start really seeing the difference between ovaries and testes. So week eight, I would count as like week seven as the beginning, the onset. Week nine, I'd pull with week 10 as when you're seeing more of the intermediate or not mature, but more developed form. That's kind of how I would characterize it. Um, but week seven and week eight are those magic numbers of the beginning of a lot of stuff. Yes, question? No, just hand, okay. And if you forget what this looks like, again, I have the little picture up here. So this is specifically female reproductive tract. So week seven, you can see an undifferentiated gonad is forming. Week 10, you can see the ducts are starting to fuse. So you can really see some differences here. And then mature form happens throughout the rest of pregnancy where, and as you, as you grow up and as you get um, your hormones added through adolescence, and then you can see kind of full descended testes, full developed secondary sex characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, when in doubt for embryology, I say seven to eight is onset of stuff. Now things can differ, things can come on a little earlier, right, or a little later. And then week 10, a lot of times things are showing more of their final or true form. I have a chat question. With the pictures, yes. So I have this, the basic answer key. Yep, so thank you also person online, John. Um, I said that at the beginning. So the answer key with just the basic multiple choice answers is on now with a brief word description. And then I'll post just like I did last week, this picture description at the end of today. So you'll get all of it. Yep, 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 yep. And then we have our next question, which we're talking about which pair of hormones is going to encourage growth and development of our and differentiation of mammary glands. So we have is it oxytocin and prolactin? Is it estrogen and progesterone? Progesterone and oxytocin or placental, lactogen and prolactin. And so estrogen and progesterone is your best answer here. They're going to be involved in growth and differentiation of mammary glands. Oxytocin and prolactin are our lactation producers. So that's why you're like, oh, we think of breast tissue with those two, but they're promoting lactation. Additionally, oxytocin can stimulate labor and then placental lactogen is secreted by the placenta and promotes regular growth and fetal metabolism. So really the key here was to be able to differentiate between oxytocin, prolactin, estrogen, and progesterone and breast development versus lactation. We then have a question, an anatomy question. So what's the function of our suspensory ligament? So what is the function of the suspensory ligament? And this is the ligament in the breast tissue. There is a suspensory ligament um, associated with the ovaries too, right? So we do need to recognize that this we're referring to breast tissue here. So I have our little picture. So is our suspensory ligament, if we didn't know what that was, does it make sense to think that something that's involved in suspension would help with secretion of milk? Probably not. Um, converging the milk ducts, eh, I don't know, it doesn't really necessarily make sense. Suspensory, it sounds very structural to me. To attach the adipose tissue to pectoral muscles, that would be a good guess, right? Suspensory attachment, that makes sense. Or to attach the mammary glands to the dermis. So I would say here, based off of, if you had no clue what you were looking at, um, C and D seem like your best answer. So I could rule out AB if you have CD. 
and it is actually D. It attaches your mammary gland tissue to the dermis. And so you can see on our little picture here, the third thing down is our sensory ligament. And it's, um, you can see that it's kind of just focusing on that mammary gland tissue right up to the dermis versus the adipose tissue to the muscles. So is this more superficial or is this deep? That's what this question is really getting at. This ligament is more superficial, attaching the gland to the dermal tissue versus um, the adipose tissue <clears throat> being attached to the pectoral muscles at the opposite end. And we can see here, I want to also show you because it is also in our ovary. We have a suspensory ligament here, right at our ovarian tissue as well. So there is a suspensory ligament in the ovarian area as well as the breast tissue. Um, they like asking about ligaments when it comes to female health. Broad ligament, round ligament are often asked about in um, female anatomy. So reviewing that might not be a bad idea. Just recognizing where their structures are, where they're attaching to. Um, I'd say when I see anatomical questions for female reproductive system, it's most of the time about those ligaments. Suspensory, broad, and round. I haven't seen a female breast tissue question about the suspensory ligament before, but they like ligament questions. All right. And then we get to a cyclical question here, which I will, I'm gonna move down and show you my diagram. So in the menstrual cycle, which hormone stimulates ovulation begins the secretory phase. So we have, is it progesterone? Is it estrogen? Is it LH or is it FSH? And so really your question here is what hormone stimulates ovulation? Not necessarily what hormones are elevated around that time, but what hormone is going to be the stimulus or the effect that's going to stimulate that egg to release? And your best answer is LH, luteinizing hormone. And you can see here you have the LH surge around the time where you have high estrogen and then your progesterone's low. Then estrogen kind of dips down and progesterone increases in that second half of cycle. FSH is also involved in the growth of ovarian follicles to produce estrogen. I don't have FSH on this diagram just because I wanted to show LH surge, but ovulation questions are common on the NPOT or actually cyclical questions in general. So understanding what's high when in a cycle would be helpful. All right, now we get to the wonderful world of iron overload. This, this vignette was on my NPOT um, or something very similar something very similar. I mean, it was a while ago, so likely maybe not used exactly again, right? But it was, it was, I remember seeing it. I was like, ah, okay. Um, 68 year old white woman with iron overload diabetes. So who knew that diabetes could be caused by iron overload? I've never, uh, you've heard of it. Great. Until I took this, I was like, I don't know. Makes sense, but I'd never seen it before. I've seen a lot of diabetes. Um, so she found type two diabetes. It was resistant to usual treatment upon further testing by her ND, go ND. It was discovered she had signs of iron overload, led to a diagnosis of hereditary hemochromatosis in both her and her sister, who had previously undetected cirrhosis of her liver. So that's your vignette. So then the question is um, asking a physiologic question to try to help you make a connection here. So how can an excess level of iron in the body cause diabetes? So I, I do have this little like increased iron store picture, which we'll look at here in a minute. But so we have four answers. B is the mechanism's not known. So that's your cop-out mechanism, right? When in doubt, it's probably not that, right? They're probably not going to ask you about things on the MPLEX that aren't known. So I would say, unless if everything seems so wrong, don't choose that answer. Uh, so we have excessive oxidation causes cellular damage to the pancreas and insulin resistance secondary to liver damage. That could make some functional sense in my brain. Impaired insulin activity due to iron impinging on this hormone and blocking its ability to bind its receptor properly. So that is almost like we're talking about like a structural like cause of squishing down impingement on hormone release. That to me, or like a cross reactivity. I'd never heard of a cross reactivity between like iron and insulin release or insulin stimulation. So that one seems less likely to me. Um, excessive oxidation of blood cells, erythrocytes, leading to improper glucose uptake and transport. That one seems like a good answer too. So if I was not, had no idea, I would be between A and D, right? So then what I'm thinking about is, okay, so how can an excess level of iron in the body actually cause diabetes? You know, am I dealing with cellular damage in the pancreas and insulin resistance second to damage, or am I dealing with inability to take up glucose and transport it? 
both sound good, right? So I think you could probably justify and hang your hat on doing either or, but the kicker here is inflammation. Diabetes is a, is a um, condition of inflammatory states. So we see here when we have an increased iron store, increased iron intake, or just, or a, a, like hemochromatosis, where you have a high iron level, you're gonna increase your inflammation, you're gonna increase oxidative stress, you're going to then affect directly your pancreatic beta cells, which decreases in insulin secretion. So you are gonna have decreased insulin secretion directly due to that oxidative stress and inflammation. You're then gonna to lead to insulin resistance. And then from there, once you have insulin resistance, you're gonna have issues with sugar intake and output. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I can see it on me, but not on your screen. There's the pretty diagram. Now you see what I'm talking about. You'll also see free fatty acid oxidation and interference with glucose disposal. And in, in the liver, you're gonna even have decreased insulin extraction. So when in doubt, when I'm thinking about some of these questions with um, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, our ischemic cardiovascular diseases, some of these common chronic diseases, I'm gonna think about inflammatory states as my etiology. So what inflammatory state could happen from this weird mechanism they're asking me about? So I'm gonna think about that mechanism first because they love asking about inflammation. So can I get there with an inflammation answer? If not, then maybe I'll go to impaired uptake or impaired synthesis, but I'm gonna to try to go down the road of inflammation being my etiology and find a question answer that kind of fits that pathway first. When in doubt, we love to talk about inflammation, but this is all the things that increased iron stores can do. Who would have known? Pretty cool. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have read it, read it either. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the only one that talks about liver damage. So you're like, okay, well, if I'm gonna go with what the case says, then that's my option, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And there, and again, right, these are not going to be your pretty worded question answers necessarily. You're looking for the one that best supports the, what the question's asking and then fits within the confines of that case, right? So I bet you many, they wrote a diabetes question and then they ended up having this answer and they wanted to connect the liver damage, which is why they added her sister in the cirrhosis to the case to justify their liver thing. Okay, great. So then we have some questions about iron transport and storage. So what protein is the main storage form for iron in the body? Your answer is ferritin here. This is helpful if you've been, especially in the clinic, because we often will measure a ferritin level on patients if we're checking for kind of a first pass check for an iron deficiency. But the thing about ferritin you should keep in mind is that it is a, an acute phase reactant. So it can increase and elevate falsely in inflammation and inflammatory states. So if this question asks, differently if it said that the patient that you have has an elevated ferritin level yet she has a decrease a microcytic anemia what nutrient would you be concerned about a deficiency for it could still be iron as your answer because ferritin could be elevated because of her inflammatory state i'm not sure if they would ask a question exactly worded like that but i could definitely see them going down that road wanting you to know that ferritin is the largest iron storage form in the body but it also can elevate um, due to inflammation so it can act just like a crp almost or an esr and increase during an inflammatory state so it can mask an iron deficiency so then they want to know what is the main transport or the main function of transferrin and so when I think of this one, I remember this because transferins, transport. So it's going to be iron transport. And if you are a diagram person, I do have this little picture for you. Um, so transferrin is going to bind to our iron. It's going to transport it to multiple different places. And it's also going to transport it back to the liver where it can be stored. Um, transferrin uh, is synthesized in the liver itself. So if you do have liver damage, then you can affect your proteins like transferrin, which then can affect um, iron uh, transport throughout the body. And then we have another embryology question. Oh my gosh, I told you this is the worst. Okay, so I'm like trying to, there we go. 
Okay, so we have another embryology question. Hepatocytes and epithelial cells in the biliary tract are derived from what? Well, stromal cells, Kupfer cells, cellate cells, and blood vessels in the liver are derived from what? This, this question, liver embryology, is a favorite because there's two different places that they derive stuff from that end up in the liver. So your endoderm is where your hepatocytes and your epithelial cells in the biliary tract are derived from, is the endoderm, versus everything else comes from your mesoderm. And so I do have this little picture down here to show you if you forgot. So you have your zygote, you have your ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Where did my thing go? Mesoderm, your hepatic mesenchyme, where all those cells that, I, that were listed occur, including that vasculature, versus your endoderm leads to the foregut, which leads to the liver hepatoblast, which leads to the liver hepatocyte and the biliary epithelium. So knowing this pathway, knowing these, these two different structures, these two different embryological etiologies happen in the liver will be important because it's an easy test question, right? It's an easy way to trick you. So it could be asked in different ways too. It could be asked um, if we were given this list, and they said, which of the following structures were embryo embryologically developed in the endoderm? And they gave you cellate cells, Cooper cells, stromal cells, and hepatocytes. Hepatocytes would be your answer. So that's a way I've seen it on the MPLEX before, listed that way too, so both directions. Cardiac, respiratory, liver, and repro tend to be hot embryologic areas that they ask questions on, and maybe some nervous system. I just pretty much listed everything. Um, I definitely would say they'll probably have some cardiac and respiratory though, because it's, it's easy and there's like some points of survival that they can talk about with respiratory and cardiac. When does circulation start? When does respiratory respiration start? So that's a really easy thing for them to pull. Um, any area where there's one organ that has multiple embryological origins, that's an easy place for them to pull. They just love reproductive questions. So it seems like some male and female stuff always ends up on there. Um, and then we will have a couple nervous system questions, which are pretty representative. All right. So then how does hepatitin affect iron levels in the body? Well, if we knew what hepatitin is, that would be great. If we didn't know what hepatitin is, then that's not super helpful. But we know it relates to iron, right? And so then we can say, okay, well, so what are our answer, what are our options? It's gonna induce the synthesis of ferritin. It's gonna increase iron absorption by colonocytes. It's gonna block transcription of the transferrin gene, or it's gonna inhibit ferroportin or portin one. So, this, again, this would be a tough one if you're not sure what hepatitin does. Hepatitin can bind and inactivate iron exporter, which is ferroportin-1, um, which is most important in iron transporting cells, but also can be important in iron intestinal cells that absorb iron um, and in hepatocyte cells. So it's not going to directly induce um, ferritin synthesis. It's not going to block the transferrin gene from being made, and it's not going to affect absorption directly from colon cells. But it is going to do, so if we go to this little guy here, so we see a state of iron overload. And we see over here, we have our, duod our duodenal enterocytes. And then we see this FPN little receptor there. And then these blue molecules, that's your hepatitin. So they're going to bind here and they're going to inactivate iron exporters. So they're going to help prevent us from letting iron go into circulation. So hepatitin, if you see hepatitin, you're trying to decrease an iron state in the body. So that would be where I would go. So how could I decrease an iron state in the body? Um, well, I could decrease the ability for iron to go from the cells to then go into circulation. And so that's what their hepatitin is doing. It's preventing and activating the iron exporter. How can iron get out um, into circulation? All right, now we're going to our rash. Rashy rash, awesome. Okay, so a 36-year-old man presents your office with a rash on both arms. Here, suddenly a day ago, no history of bug bites or allergies. He's not sure about um, other kind of exogenous stuff except for a new cream his wife gave him. The rash is arithmetic, so red, warm, and non-critic, so not itchy. So then we, then we see 
a question that's completely unrelated. So you don't even need to know anything about this case to have answered this question. Active transport involves the pumping of substances across a membrane with the aid of energy. That's active transport. They gave you a definition. The transport of two substances in opposite directions is called antiport, symport, secondary active transport, or primary active transport. It's on the next page. And the answer is antiport. They're going in opposite directions, anti, the reverse directions of each other. So again, this is why we read the questions first and then answer them if we can from our brain, then read the answers because you didn't even need to waste your time with the vignette for this one to get this question answered. It has nothing to do with the vignette. Um, Symport going in the same direction. Uh, secondary active transport and primary active transport are just direct describing two different types of active transport. They're not describing molecules moving in certain directions. So those are trying to just grab you by saying, oh, we have active transport on us, right? You should choose us as an answer. Now we have a question that is kind of not really directly related, but loosely related, it's talking about thermoregulation. So I guess skin warmth is how they asked this question with this vignette. The hypothalamus is a major player in thermoreg. You are able to identify hot and cold areas of the skin through peripheral receptors. These receptors are located within which layer? Your epidermis, your dermoepidermal junction, your dermis, or your hypodermis? When in doubt, all the goods for your skin are in the dermis, okay? So if you aren't sure, and I'll, pull, I'll move it back up here in a second, but all of the good stuff, all the functional things are going to be located in the dermis and the skin. And we can see that, um, you know, I don't even think it lists what they were specifically asking for, peripheral receptors, but your peripheral receptors are here. All of your immune system cells are here. Your blood vessel supply is here. The epidermis just has keratinized cells, right, that are moving up and out. It doesn't have any actual cells that are recepting any nervous system information. There's no innervation and no communication moving in and out of that epidermal layer, okay? There is an important cell, two important cells in the epidermal layer, um, well, kind of three, which we'll see our Langerhans, our keratinocyte, and our melanocyte. Uh, CD8 cells can move into the epidermis when they decide that they want to kill a foreign invader, which is helpful. That's how we can treat a skin infection, right? So our skin, um, yeah, skin infection by CD8 cells coming into the surface. But for the most part, all of our other cells that are important to us are going to be um, in the dermal layer. So when in doubt, the dermal layer is the functional layer of the skin. Our epidermal layer is going to be more of the, I'm trying to find my mouse, this is going to be more of our protective layer of our skin. Epidermal layer. Epidermal. Dermal. So then we have another question about skin stuff. So what type of cells in the epidermis are antigen presenting dendritic cells? So we're going to move up to the epidermis. There's not many cells that we have to choose from. Our Langerhans, our keratinocytes, our melanocytes are CD8 T cells and DETC. So the only immune system cells that are really hanging out here is Langerhans and CD8 T cells. CD8 T cells are not helper cells, they're killer T cells. So our only option is Langerhans cell. If you didn't know what a Langerhans cell is, they gave you, they gave you four answer, four options, and I'll pull them down here. Keratinocytes, which we know, not immune system involvement, right? Produce correction keratin. Merkel cells, well, okay, maybe if we don't remember what Merkel cell is. Langerhans cells and melanocytes. Melanocytes, pigment producing. So you really are between B and C here. If you know, you know Langerhans cells um, have, they present their antigen presenting molecules. Their main goal is to present antigens on their surface. Um, Merkel cells maybe play a role in light touch, so they're not involved. And then I already mentioned melanocytes are involved in skin pigmentation. All right, then we have a question about glutathione synthesis. Let me move that over. So a major player in detox is glutathione. Again, did we need to read the vignette for any of these questions? No, it had nothing to do with our vignette. So our poor rashy guy. We didn't have to have any questions asked about him. So a major player in, glut in detoxification of glutathione, which of the following is a major cofactor in the synthesis of GSH, which is reduced glutathione? So you have vitamin E, you have magnesium, niacin, and B6. So when we're talking about cofactors, I want you to go to magnesium and less if you know it's a B vitamin involved. 
Magnesium is probably your best guess. B6, B3 are used a lot too. Vitamin E should be your easy throw out. Vitamin E is not going to be used as a cofactor. It's also of the vitamins, a fat soluble vitamin, less likely to be used within those reactions or at all as a cofactor in those reactions because most of the reactions are taking place in water. So magnesium is your answer here. Niacin, I think of being as a, um, a molecule, not directly as a cofactor, but molecule that makes up components of our biochemical pathways, right? It's involved in NADP and NADPH and NADH and NAD, but it's not, as in, it's not a cofactor, it's a part of that molecule, niacin. Same with riboflavin, right? It's FAD and FADH2. Riboflavin is a molecule in, in actually inside that FADH2 and FADH. It's not a cofactor that attaches on, moves the reaction forward, and then detaches. Magnesium is by far your most common. We talked about molybdenum for a few specific reactions, right, that, are very, that aren't that many. B6 is another one that we'll see used as a true cofactor that attaches and detaches. But magnesium is probably your best guesser if you have no clue. You'd be pretty safe with a guess of magnesium. You're not going to be right all the time, but I'm saying you're just going to be safer than guessing some of the other options. Okay. Now we have our 68 year old male with a white, or with a, he's a white male with an ischemic stroke. He um, presents one month after suffering from a mild stroke in his anterior cerebral artery. You know, it's the brain. He has a history of hypertension, hyperhomocystinemia, and type 2 diabetes. He wants to improve his health. Well, good, he came to us. All right. So then we have a question about hyperhomocystinemia can result from a mutation of what? Nothing, MTHFR, CST3, and NOS3. We saw a similar type question before in our last practice exam, and the only one that we recognized was MTHFR. It also, if you know what MTHFR is involved in, it's directly that conversion from homocysteine to methionine. So I'm pulling up my picture here. So here's our cycle. So we can see we have some protein that comes in, we make methionine, then we go through a couple of reactions to get homocysteine. On the other side, we have homocysteine, we need vitamin B12, we need folate, and then NTHFR acts on this side here to progress and move this reaction forward, right? MTHFR goes through this cycle, and when we do a turn of this cycle, it moves homocysteine to methionine. So if we have a mutation or an issue with our MTHFR gene, this process of homocysteine to methionine is not going to exist, which then we're going to have an increase in homocysteine, which then is how we get to hyperhomocysteinemia, right? Elevated homocysteine in the blood, right? Even if you didn't know what that condition is, you can medical terminology and figure it out. Hyper, a lot, homocysteine, the thing, emia in the blood. And that's why we often talk about needing methylated B12 and folate in someone who has an MTHFR defect because they're both involved as cofactors in this reaction. All right. Now moving on to some questions about vascular or no cellular anatomy first and then vascular anatomy next, I think. Uh, so infarction in the brain causes death of astrocytes and microglia, which are both brain cells that are involved in the immune system in the brain, or at least one of them is. Which of the following is not a correct statement regarding these cell types? So astrocytes provide structural support. Is that not correct? No, astrocytes do provide structural support. That is correct. The number of microglia usually decrease after brain or spinal injury. Well, that is the correct answer, and we'll explain why here in a second. Microglia phagocytize bacteria and cellular debris. That is literally the function of microglia. That is what they do in the brain. So that's correct. Astrocytes form scar tissue in response to brain injury. That is also correct. Maybe if you didn't know that, that might be your other guess, right? It's maybe B versus D, because A and C is literally the function of those cells. So then if you look at here, the number of microglia usually decrease after brain or spinal injury. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? If something dies and we have injury and we have inflammatory cells and we have scar tissue formation, we're gonna have a lot of stuff that needs to be cleaned up, right? Clean up on aisle four. And that's gonna recruit more cells like microglia or macrophages to help clean up that excess of debris. So logically, if you know microglia are going to be involved in phagocytosis, and anytime there's inflammation or cell death or tissue death or scar tissue formation, 
where there's a lot of stuff that needs cleanup, microglia are actually going to increase because that's their function, right? They're going to help support that cleanup process. And then astrocytes do form scar tissue. So that helps kind of thinking through logically. You would not have to know, you would need to know A and C to answer this question, but you would not need to know B or D. You just need to be able to logically think about what the function of microglia does. All right, this next question is my least favorite and favorite question. Well, not my least favorite, but it's, it's a good one. Which of the following inhibits platelet aggregation, therefore preventing blood clot formation? And you have thromboxane A2, prostaglandin E2, prostaglandin F2, and prostacyclin PG12, or PGI2, sorry. So your question is really, what's the difference between thromboxane, prostaglandins, and prostacyclin, okay? Prostacyclins is your answer, because prostacyclin is gonna prevent blood clot formation by inhibiting platelet um, aggregation, and it also promotes vasodilation. So that's your answer, that's the why. But let's think, maybe you weren't sure what prostacyclin does. So thrombox, thromboxane is actually gonna activate that platelet cascade, it's gonna help form a clot, so it's not gonna prevent it. And it's also gonna vasoconstrict things. So it's gonna do the opposite of what our prostacyclins do, is our thromboxane A2. Then our two prostaglandins, these are actually involved in specific causes of the body. So if you are the type of person that needs that specific etiology to feel good in your brain. Um, prostaglandin E2 is directly more, it's actually a medication, but it's involved in evacuation of urine contents and labor induction. And then prostaglandin F2 alpha, it stimulates also kind of smooth muscle and bronchial contraction, and it can produce vasoconstriction. So our only vasodilator here is prostacyclin, and it's also the only thing that's going to prevent blood clot formation because it's going to inhibit our platelet aggregation, okay? Prostaglandin E2 can cause some vasodilation um, versus prosta F2 alpha causes vasoconstriction, but prostaglandin E2 is specifically involved in like those uterine contractions and labor stimulation typically. And then the blood supply stuff. Okay, let's get this up here. So the cortical branches of the anterior cerebral artery supply which of the following? This is just knowing an anatomy question. It's nothing else, nothing exciting besides knowing the blood supply anatomy and where it's supplying in the brain. So lateral anterior and temporal lobes. No, it's the medial, frontal, and parietal lobe. That's where the anterior cerebral artery supply follows. It's frontal here, kind of in the middle, the medial frontal. And then your parietal lobes is where your anterior cerebral artery supply. Uh, what I did for these is I just looked up a picture. They have some really good color coded pictures online that show where the different arteries and show like provide blood supply to the brain. And I just memorized that picture kind of in some patterns. And then you'll be able to get most of these questions correct. Uh, they do like blood flow or blood supply of the brain and the heart. Those are their favorites, which makes sense. They're blood supply questions. So looking at the brain blood supply and cardiac blood supply, which we've already done, would be helpful. We'll do a little bit of this on our neuro day, which is tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to do some neuroanatomy. We'll do cranial nerves. We'll do some um, nerve singling pathways. So we will hit a little bit of this tomorrow with some of the nervous system. Or not tomorrow, Thursday, whenever we're here again. Don't come tomorrow. I won't be here. <laughs> or I guess come. I lived in the library when I studied for NFL. All right, then we have 18 year old Jewish woman with abdominal pain. Why we've got this information, I don't know. Um, there's nothing about Ashkenazi Jew being like an elevated risk factor. That's the only reason I feel like that would be appropriate for this type of a question, um, but they didn't, yeah, or didn't even mention that. So great. Anyways, she comes into the clinic with chronic abdominal pain. It comes and goes throughout the day. She has bouts of diarrhea that she believes is triggered by certain food groups. Well, that doesn't shock me. All right, which of the following is false about celiac disease? So again, she, we don't know if she has celiac disease. We're just being asked a question about celiac disease. So is the villi in the ileum damaged by gluten causing malabsorption of nutrients? Sounds pretty good. Um, but we're looking for the false one, right? Sounds pretty good though. So we're, we're gonna skip that because it seems like the mechanism, obviously we know it's the false one, which I'll tell you why. But celiac is most often presents in childhood, but can present in adulthood. We know that one's true. That typically presents as a child, but can present as an adult. 
Uh, selective IgA deficiency can be a risk factor for celiac disease development. We talked a little about that yesterday. It can cause a false negative response for a celiac test. Uh, we have decreased mucus, um, increased mucus adherence. We have decreased villi, we have increased villi blunting. The degree of villus damage is not correlated with the severity of symptoms. That is actually true. You do not know until you do an endoscopy and take a biopsy and see the tissue, the level or the degree of pathology of that tissue. You could have an asymptomatic person with complete obstruction and blunting of your villi. You could have a very symptomatic person that has normal tissue inside. So they haven't, they don't have that symptom correlation. So your answer is A. And the reason why is they gave you the wrong location. That's the only reason. They said ilium, it is jejunum. That is the only reason that's wrong. Can it affect the ileum? It could in theory, but it's much more likely to affect the jejunum of the small intestine. So that's the only reason why that question or that statement is incorrect, causing us to then choose A as our answer. Yeah? No. It's still wrong. It's still a wrong statement. Absolutely. It's not damaged by the gluten itself, but the reason why they are justifying that question as being wrong and what they say would be right is by changing it to jejunum. Yeah. Yes, correct. It would still be incorrect, although I could definitely see them saying that as a correct answer and having something else wrong, like having it be um, the villi and the jejunum are damaged by gluten, causing malabsorption of nutrients being a correct answer, and then them changing something to it most often presents in adulthood and that being your incorrect then. Yep. So again, this is a test of choosing the best answer that they provided you with, even if it's still not a great answer, right? So when we think about differentiating between the two types of IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, which of the following is true now? So we have an opposite. We were trying to figure out what was false. Now we're trying to figure out what's true. So we have an ESR and CRP would be elevated in both. We have a cigarette smoking as a risk factor for both, and that's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis or ulcerative disease, why they put UD. I don't know. CD can occur in the mucosa and submucosa of the entire GI tract versus UC is limited to the rectum and descending colon. Both, both UC and CD may display an anal fistula and ichthys stomatitis. And ulcerative colitis has skip lesions while Crohn's disease does not. So they're looking for what's the best, most true answer. The response they gave was ESR and CRP would be elevated, which is true. They would be elevated in both conditions, ESR and CRP, because they're general markers of inflammation. They're going to be elevated in pretty much any inflammatory condition that you have, right? So that makes sense. Crohn's disease has skip lesions, so that's not UC. Anal fistula and apthys stomatitis are linked with CD, so Crohn's. Crohn's can be in the transdermal layer of the GI. And then smoking only, in theory, increases the risk of Crohn's disease, um, although there may be some recent argument against that. But right now, what they have is Crohn's disease and smoking are the ones that are linked. So that is your... That is your... Um, Reasoning the the C the trickiest one here I think is C because C is talking about um, like pathology and location which in theory the the locations are correct but the it's the transdermal layer versus this mucosa and submucosa is where they got you for that question that's why that's not a correct answer for C yeah yes separating the two, which this is not, this, this separation is correct, right? Because they, the actual anatomy, the locations they listed were correct. It's the actual layer that they listed for Crohn's that's incorrect. It's transdermal, but that doesn't separate, that doesn't change the separation of the two based off of actual anatomical location. Absolutely. Yeah. Annoying. Yes. Sorry. Always near the rectum. Oh, spare the rectum, it typically spares the rectum. Typically, Crohn's typically will spare the rectum, but it doesn't always. Yeah. UC typically is limited to the rectum and descending colon. Again, generalizations. Is it always? No, but typically, yes.
So that one's fun. We love that question. Okay. You're getting used to kind of what you expect tonight, right? You're getting better at ruling out some answers. I'd say you're probably able to rule out at least one answer per question at this point. And then from there, you're left with three. If you can get down to two. That's why I told you is your goal. Get down to 50-50 chance for the questions that you don't absolutely know an answer to. If you can get be getting 50% on these practice exams, you're doing well. If you get half the questions right, you're doing well. If you can get closer to 70%, you're doing excellent. You will absolutely probably pass. I can't guarantee it, but probably. Because typically up to 25 to 50% of the exam is going to get thrown out. A large portion of questions. If you're getting 50% right, you have a high probability of ending up passing based off of what questions get thrown out. So when you're going through practice tests, try to get to 50% is your first goal. Then the closer you get to 70, the better. Okay. All right. Choose the correct answer. The electrolyte concentration in the stool sample would be. So this is asking about osmotic versus secretory di diarrhea. So do you have a table just for a reminder? So normal, the, are electrolyte concentrations normal in both? No. Greater than normal and osmo in both. So are they in the same direction? Those are the first two questions. They're asking, are they both in the same direction, the same way? Which is no. Is it lower than normal and osmotic and normal in secretory? Or is it lower than normal and osmotic and greater in secretory? Or is it greater in osmotic and lower in secretory? So that's kind of what they're asking about. They want to know, do you know the differences between osmotic and secretory diarrhea? So this table here can be kind of helpful. You can see that you'll see an elevation in sodium, you'll see a elevation in chloride, you'll see an elevation in pH, versus you see a lowering in all three of them in osmotic diarrhea. So you see a lowering in your sodium, you'll see a lowering in chlorine, chloride, and you'll see a lowering in pH. And then these are some potential options of why you can have these diarrheal conditions. Um, when I think about these, I think about um, secretory diarrhea being more associated with like our E. coli or Vib cholerea, or like rice water diarrhea, where you get really dehydrated really fast, and that's partially because you're losing a lot of electrolytes in your stool. So that's how I remember that secretory diarrhea is going to pull electrolytes out, so it's associated with more of those dysentery um, bacterial infections, which the big risk for those oftentimes is electrolyte um, insufficiencies or dehydration. Right. Versus osmotic, we're just talking about water, right? Osmosis. So with osmotic diarrhea, really pulling water through, we're not caring as much about electrolytes. So if you want to remember it in reverse, osmotic, osmosis, water. So you're still having loose stool, but you're pulling less electrolytes out with it. And then which of the following is least likely to be the diagnosis? So this is a question you have to know the clinical vignette. You have to have read the clinical vignette. So really, she said that she thought she had a food-related uh, diarrheal or stomach condition. So what's the only one here that's not related necessarily with food intake that she's taking with some type of external exposure? It'd be Giardia infection. So that, and that typically also would be acute, not chronic. The rest of them are chronic conditions that could have a food association. So that's how you get to your Giardia as being the not correct answer here for the least likely diagnosis, whereas IBS, IBD, or celiac could be involved. All right, so we're doing good. We'll get through this and then we'll give you a break, okay? So let's just keep powering through, is that fine? Yeah, great. Um, and if you want me to slow up or speed, if you want me to speed up and just go through it with the right answers, let me know. If it's helpful for me to kind of walk my way through reasoning, then I'll keep doing that. So we have our 23 year old woman with fatigue. She reports menstrual cycles been heavier, difficulty getting out of bed, overall sluggish. She's afebrile, but pale. Nail and hair is, a, hair is brittle. She has pale mucous membranes. It's like your classic, right? Iron deficient person. She has lab results show low RBC, low hemoglobin, low serum iron, and low serum ferritin. So you're like, okay, well, I know now what we're talking about. And then your first question is which vitamin is a cofactor in ALA synthase? You're like, what the heck? A rate limiting enzyme in heme synthesis. Okay, at least we're talking about heme synthesis. 
So this is the one where we're looking at our answers and what is the most likely correct response. Our only B vitamin here is B6. So that's the one I'm going to choose, even if I have no idea that that's the correct answer. Vitamin C is not a common cofactor. It could, it could be used, but it's not common. Vitamin A, I'd say even more rare, and vitamin K, even more rare, unless if you're talking about your clotting cascade, because they're fat-soluble vitamins, and these are occurring in, most of the time, water-soluble regions, a lot of these enzymatic reactions. So vitamin B6 is our correct answer. It seems synthesis happens mainly in liver and bone marrow, and so succinyl-CoA and glycine combine with B6 to form ALA. But even if you had no idea, B6 to me seems like the most correct response there. So which of the following is a non-heme-containing molecule? So again, if you don't know what xanthine oxidase is, fine, move on. Myoglobin, we know, has heme. Hemoglobin, we know, has heme. It's in the name. So then you are left with xanthine oxidase and cytochrome P450 enzymes. Well, cytochrome P450 does have heme in it. So your answer is xanthine oxidase. And this is the picture. I'll show you what xanthine oxidase looks like. Here's your xanthine oxidase molecule. So no heme present, does have a nitrogen in there. But if you were, had no clue, you could at least get it down to two, right? Yeah. It's involved in our purine catabolism. So I do have that up here. I listed it if you wanted to know. I didn't put its actual like cycle because I didn't care to enough. Um, but it's involved in purine catabolism, so breakdown of our purine molecules in our body. Um, and it has the process involved. I can, I can show it to you. I had it on here, and then I was like, it's unlikely to be important for you, so why include it? But if you're curious, I will move this over. Oh, here. Okay. So you can see here, purines break down. You have your xanthine and then uric acid on this side, and then xanthine oxidase helps in that step from purines to xanthine before you get there. Would you ever know that? Not unless you're a biochemist and probably studying like purine metabolism and catabolism, but I would say. Can be helpful. Okay. There we go. Great. So again, for this question, my biggest giveaway would be just looking for the two that I know have hemoglobin, and then I have a 50-50 shot. And if you do know now cyto cytochrome P450 enzymes, they do also have heme. So that whole class has heme. So now any other option they give you is going to be that answer. All right. Then we get to what is the role of lactoferrin? So another thing that's like, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't. So this is lactoferrin in all of its roles. So we're going to look at that here in a minute. But what is the role of lactoferrin? Does it transport iron in the blood? No. We know transferrin transports the iron in the blood. Previously, we were asked that question, right? So transferrin is that one. Does it move iron to bodily secretions like breast milk? Well, that sounds very specific. So I'm going to move past that question for now, that answer for now. Does it chelate iron during infections to prevent its use by microbes? Well, that's interesting. And does it store iron in the blood? Well, no, because I know ferritin was my big iron storage molecule, right? So we've already had two of these questions answered in this test. So we would rule out A and D. So then you have, you have B and C. Now, lactoferrin, you could want to think about lactoferrin, lactate, and think about breast milk, right? And that would be a very reasonable assumption to go down that road. And that's why they put that answer there, right? They're trying to directly detract you. But it, what its process is, is it does chelate iron during infections to prevent it from being used by microbes. That is what lactoferrin's purpose is. Um, it prevents worsening of inflammation. We know that transferrin is the transport, ferritin is the storage, and lactoferrin cannot move into bodily secretions like breast milk. So the other way that you could know, hmm, no, that would be, yeah. You just need to know that lactoferrin does not move it into the secretions of breast milk. But I would say you could at least get to 50-50 in this question again and then have a guess. But this is all the things that lactoferrin can do. So it can bind protein. Iron, it's an iron binding protein. So it can do oh, iron absorption. 
sequestration and inhibits biofilm formation. Um, as a host, these are its activities in the host that can help with the bone, bone formation. It's anti-inflammatory. So I think of it sometimes as the opposite of ferritin. Ferritin is an inflammatory molecule or an acute phase reactant. Lactoferritin, lactoferrin is anti-inflammatory. Um, it can help with some immune healing and immune system cell recruitment. It has some direct, obviously, pathogen activities then. It can be anti-everything because it prevents iron usage. Let me use the vaccine adjuvant. I think the biggest ones are it helps with iron absorption, sequestration, and inhibiting biofilms, and it prevents all of your bugs by not letting them use your iron to do stuff. But I think if you chose the breast milk one, you were using logical brain sense. So I would not get mad at yourself. That was a good guess. All right, all of these are risk factors for iron deficiency anemia, except D, obesity is not a risk factor for iron deficiency. Um, black tea and coffee with meals can decrease iron absorption, which is why we say don't drink black tea or coffee when you're having an iron rich meal, when you're trying to absorb iron, or if you take an iron supplement. Um, malnutrition, absolutely. If you don't get adequate iron in, you're not gonna have adequate iron stores. And menstruation, because you're lo you losing some iron every month. So obesity is the only one here that doesn't make sense. Okay, so now we have our little girl with Marfan's. She has, a, she's coming in new. Her parents are seeking supportive care for her cardiovascular system. They worry about risk for aortic dissection. Do you know? Okay, so Marfan's must be a risk for aortic dissection. If you didn't know, because they tell you. So then we have a question that talks about Marfan's and an actual cytokine. Research suggests transforming growth factor beta abnormalities play a role in developing Marfan phenotype. Which of the following is not a principal function of T transcription or transforming growth factor beta, TFT beta? So this one, you could have memorized that cytokine flow chart we showed before, or you could look at these answers. So is it enhancing IgA? So increasing that, I, that antibody that's gonna be involved in mucous membranes. Is it going to be stopping macrophage activation? Is it going to be stopping T site proliferation, T cell um, proliferation? Or is it going to be enhancing neutrophil recruitment? So which one does it not do? So we have here, we have one thing that's going to increase our immune system, two things that would decrease our immune system, and another thing that's going to increase our immune system. So that's kind of how I would look at this. The answer is it does not increase neutrophil recruitment. It's actually going to do the opposite. It's going to inhibit neutrophil recruitment. How would you know this? You wouldn't, unless if you had this fabulous little chart. So TGF beta does everything except for neutrophils. So just when in doubt, TGF beta is going to literally be involved in activating and being encouraging all the things in our immune system, except for it's not gonna encourage neutrophil recruitment, it's gonna encourage lymphocyte recruitment. So this is going to increase our lymphocyte cells. It's going to not increase our neutrophil cells. So if you had to remember one thing about TF or TGF beta, it is that it does not increase neutro neutrophils to the site. It's going to increase everything else in the immune system. It's going to do all the other things, but neutrophils. And we can see that here. B cells, T cells, macrophages, all the things, no neutrophils. All right, then we have some more stuff about Marfan's, but really it's not about Marfan's at all. It's about eye anatomy. Bilateral eye lens dislocation is a physical manifestation of Marfan's syndrome. Which of the following is true about the eye lens? So this, you don't have to have any knowledge of Marfan's to know this question answer. So we're gonna look at a picture as we go through the answer choices. Does the eye lens receive nutrients from the aqueous humor or vitreous humor? We have to decide where the eye lens is going to receive its nutrition from. And then we have to decide where it's bound to or where it's attached to. Is it the ciliary body, body or the choroid? So we can see here, and I'll go to this side too. We can see our eye lens is here in the middle. We can see that our ciliary body is here. And so we can see that it's attached directly to the ciliary body. So ciliary body is where it's attached to, which is how you're able to get rid of, I think, uh, B and D. So then you have to figure out, are you thinking it's nutrition from the aqueous or the vitreous? 
So vitreous being this direction, aqueous being this direction. I think this one may have aqueous humor. It's not even on here, but it's located with this anterior chamber of the eye. And that is where the lens gets its nutrition from. It's the aqueous humor, not the vitreous humor. If I'm remembering this answer for myself or trying to remember eye anatomy, I think of the lens as almost like my, um, my barrier between what receives stuff from the aqueous and what receives stuff from the vitreous. And so anything with lens anteriorly, I'm going to think, I'm going to think that it's getting its nutrition from its, the aqueous humor. Anything behind posterior, behind the lens is vitreous humor. But so it ends up being A as the answer. And so this is, again, you can get down to, if you knew either one, if you didn't know both, you could get down to 50-50 and then take an educated guess. You did not have to have any knowledge, though, of Marfan's to answer this question. So then we have a, a question about um, complications. So the following, which of the following congenital conditions is not predisposed for aortic dissection? So we have Turner, Down, Osteogenesis Imperfecta, and EVS. Now, this, if you knew all these conditions, great. You also could think about which um, one of these is different from the others. EDA, EDS is like a connective tissue disorder like Marfan's, right? It's different than Marfan's, but it is a connective tissue disorder. So if Marfan's can cause aortic dissection, EDS is probably going to be able to cause it too. So then you, you remove D. Turner's syndrome is caused by the absence of genes, which causes cardiovascular malformations that increase the risk of dissection. So it's not... Um, Absence of genes, which causes cardiovascular section. That the answer doesn't make sense, so I will change it. I was like, it's proving that it's also not increasing risk. Osteogenesis imperfecta is also affecting collagen, which is going to affect aortic dissection, increasing risk. So Down syndrome is the only one that doesn't directly cause increased risk of aortic dissection. It is going. People with Down syndrome are going to be at risk for congenital heart defects but not with actual collagen or tissue changes, connective tissue issues that would cause the increased risk of tearing of the aorta. And so that's what they're specifically asking for here. Um, I think you could probably get, you could probably rule out EDS and osteogenesis and then be stuck with turners and downs um, and then have to pick between the two of them. Uh, that would be probably your best, your best place for this question. Down syndrome is what I would probably guess which with no justification of why I would have guessed it. <laughs> and then we have a specific question about Marfan's. What gene is affected? So again, I listed some of those genes that you might need to know, and that's why Marfan's was on that list. So it's fibrillin 1, which is a gene that leads to impaired synthesis of connective tissue. Um, fibrin, fibrillin 1 proteins. I do have a picture here for you. So this picture shows normal up top healthy state. And then in Marfan syndrome, so you can see in Marfan syndrome, your um, fibrillin one protein, your fibrillin one genes affected or not, it's not working properly. It allows for less fibrillin one protein, which the fibers then are too weak, which is what causes a lot of issues with Marfan's itself. Um, mutations of collagen four lead to Alport syndrome. So this is again, knowing some of these genetic conditions and what they can lead to. Mutations in dystrophin called, cause Duchenne and Becker muscular, muscular dystrophies, which I remember dystrophin and dystrophy. So I connect in my brain dystrophin and dystrophy. So I know it's not Marfan's. And then polycystin one is um, it, mutations of that cause autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. So I think polycystin, I remember as polycystic. So that's how I make those connections. So dystrophin, dystrophy, polycystin, polycystic kidney, collagen type four, I just remember it's Alport, and then fibrillin one is Marfan's. I would say of these, Marfan's is probably the most, Marfan's and EDS, um, those would be likely conditions that could show up on your test. They've had Marfan's a couple years in a row, so um, they do like asking questions about Marfan's. They also love asking about multiple sclerosis, the so multiple sclerosis, high likelihood, or myasthenia gravis. They like to include one or both of those on the test and try to confuse you between the two. So our multiple sclerosis questions, 
We have a 49-year-old Hispanic woman presenting with a previous diagnosis of MS. She was diagnosed a couple years, has been managing it with some meds. Her medical history consists of previous case of optic neuritis associated with her MS and hypertension. Main symptoms was the glove and stocking paresthesia that she experiences today. Numbness and tingling began in her feet and presented now to her hands. So then we have here, what nerves are involved if a patient's suffering from glove paresthesia? So just glove, they don't mention glove and stocking here, they're just asking about the glove portion. So if you're like, what is that? You could read the vignettes and then have an idea of, oh, glove hands, but you can also just make that connection yourself. So then you're looking at what nerves affect this region, this dermatomal region of the hand. Your most obvious is radial, ulnar, and median. So don't make it more complicated. That is your correct answer. The three nerves that are associated with the hand, you did not need to move up higher, right? Because we're just talking about the glove. We're not talking about like an ulnar or radial neuropathy. We're not talking about when we move the shoulder, we're having these issues. We don't need to go higher up in the system. We just need to know what is, are the nerves serving that superficial sensation in your hand. So radial, median, and ulnar are your three. Suprascapular, again, up top, too high. Axillary, too high. Um, axillary, muscular, cutaneous, and median. I mean, that's nice. But again, we're really looking at glove and stocking. And so none of these, none of these other answers explain it as well as radial, ulnar, and median nerves. This is one of those that you get to that you've had a rough NPLEX and you get to that question. You're like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> maybe like I, I know all three of those words and they all make sense. Like, okay. We got this. I was saying, then the optic neuritis, inflammation of optic nerves, they tell you it, they tell you it's related to MS. And then they say the optic nerve is supplied by the ophthalmic artery, which comes from what artery in the brain? So again, I told you vasculature in the brain, they love to ask questions about, because it's a small area that connects to a lot of structure. So is it the anterior cerebral, the inter external carotids, the middle cerebral, or the internal carotids? So when I'm thinking about this question, if I have not studied my brain vascularity, how I'd go about this question is looking first at their arteries. All of them are arteries, so I can't have any differentiation there. I have two that are cerebral and two that are carotid. Of my cerebral, I have anterior and middle, and of my carotid, I have external and internal. So when I think about the optic nerve um, supply and the ophthalmic artery, the optic nerve is pretty deep within my, my brain, my head, right? And then the ophthalmic artery must be deep too, right? If it's by that optic nerve. So that justification then, I'm probably not gonna do anything external. So that's gonna get rid of B for me because it, I, I'm thinking it's a deeper structure. Then I'm like, is it really coming from the brain or is it coming from something coming out of the brain? And if we know where the structure of the optic nerve and the ophthalmic nerve are, they are not actually inside your brain, right? They have actually exited the brain. So then blood flow, that blood supply that exits the brain is carotid. So I'm gonna choose my internal carotid as my answer. Anterior and middle cerebral arteries, great answers too, but they are supplying brain tissue primarily. So if I don't think this is coming directly from the brain itself, I'm gonna choose the one answer that makes sense that's extended down from my brain. And that would be the only one left, which is internal carotid. That's how I'd answer this. I personally did not study vasculature of, the, of anything that well for the MPLEX and then had to make a lot of those justifications as I was going through and did surprisingly well in anatomy by the grace of something. I don't know. The NPLEX gods were nice to me that day. But that's how I justified those, those type of answers. Don't be like me. Study the brain vasculature. Multiple sensory neurons in your skin detect different stimuli in your environment. Thank you for the statement of facts. They love giving you random statements of facts in these questions and then asking you another question. So the mesonere corpuscles can sense gentle touch. What is the name of the nerve that can sense stretching and twisting? So they're at, that's their specific question they're asking is underneath the skin, what nerve can sense stretching and twisting? It's your Rufani endings, um, which you can see right here, these little green ones right there. Oh good, it shows them at the same place on the same time. Uh, so this is probably my favorite picture, just to remember which nerves do what, because it's easy. So heavy pressure, our mesonere corpuscle, our vibration is your pastinian corpuscle, your light touch is Merkel, and then your skin stretch is Rufani endings. And again, all four of these in the dermis, right? So this is also a great question to ask about 
dermis versus epidermis um, versus subcutaneous tissue. So this could be really good derm integumentary plus nervous system questions. So this is just kind of going to be a memorization of knowing these nerves. Which one says which? Probably one or two questions max on that on the test. So another embryology question. It's like literally our biggest nightmare. Neural crest cells migrate to various locations. Unless we know embryology, then you're like, this is the best. Neural crest cells migrate to various locations, forming all the following structures except they love these except questions. So I'm gonna pull up the picture first. So the neural crest cells make all of the things except for one. Your options are bone, brain, dorsal root ganglia, and cartilage. So the one thing you should remember is the brain is the only structure that's formed from a neural tube of that list. The rest of them come from neural crest. So bone, dorsal root ganglia, cartilage, like most of the time neural crest is a good answer, but the brain itself comes from the neural tube. And I think about that as neural tube as more of my central nervous system and my brain is a part of the CNS with the spinal cord. And so neural tube and brain, I have those connected from that. Neural crest cells also form endocrine skin and heart. So neural crest, like I said, when in doubt is a really good answer because it forms so many things, but the neural tube itself does form the, the brain. And I remember that because I think of the tube as kind of like a spinal cord and the CNS, the brain is part of the CNS with the spinal cord. So that's how I remember neural tube and brain. Neural crest cells though, these little neural crest cells are gonna form pretty much everything else. So your smooth muscle, osteoblast and chondroblast, the bone, fat cells, melanocytes, sympho, adrenal cells, Schwann cells, odontroblast, neurons, they do pretty much everything but the brain. You'll never forget it now. Okay, 77-year-old man with tachypnea, fast breathing. So he's a 40-pack year history. He has fever, tachypnea, malaise. He's coughing frequently and produced rust-colored sputum. Ooh, yikes. Um, physical exam, we see adventitious breath sounds, negophony. Our CXR chest x-ray reveals infiltrates and confirms pneumonia. Again, how these always go. Don't spend brain power trying to diagnose them. They give it to you. A speed and sample sent away. So not a lot of helpful information outside. We know he has pneumonia with some rust colored sputum and a pack year history. So then we have here, which of the following correctly describes Legionella pneumophila, another etiology of pneumonia. So this is where if you know your grams and your aerobicity, you can get a majority of these bacteria. Same as if you know your grams and your catalase and your grams and your encapsulations. So those would be like your high yields, right? Gram positive or negative. What does it do with oxygen? Does it have a capsule? And is it catalase positive or negative? Those are probably going to be the big things they ask you about if they have a direct bacterial question like this. And from yesterday, I said study bacteria first, viruses, parasites, fungi, and then your prions. That's your order of caring. So this is an aerobic which we could think about because it's in the lungs, right? So we can think, okay, if it causes an pneumonia, it's probably not gonna be an anaerobe. So we can rule out B and C. And then from there, you just have to know if it's gram negative or gram positive. A lot of our weird bacteria that does like odd stuff or comes from water or comes in our food or is gonna be a gram negative. A lot of our normal bacteria that we see, like our staphs and our strep, our normal causes of pneumonia or mycoplasmas, those are gonna be gram positive. That's kind of how I think about these bacteria if I didn't know, if I was guesstimating. But you could, again, at least get down to A and D by thinking about, well, if it's going to cause a respiratory issue, it probably needs oxygen to function or at least doesn't not want oxygen, right? So facultative could have also been an, an, an answer. Okay, so what of the following is not a characteristic of a typical pneumonia? So we're talking about an atypical pneumonia, a not normal pneumonia, so which of the following is not associated with a not normal pneumonia, double negative. So with atypical pneumonia, it, pneumonia is inflammation confined to the alveolar wall interstitium. And that is true. Is intraalveolar hyaline membranes present? That's also true. Is the onset more insidious than normal bacterial pneumonia? That is also true. Atypical pneumonia is more of an insidious slow onset, right? 
and is actually commonly found in alveolar spaces. That is not true. So think about atypical pneumonia as walking pneumonia, right? A pneumonia that you can't necessarily see clinically. So if you think about that as being a walking pneumonia, you're going to have a cough that's not so productive, not so sputum-based. So you're less likely to see exudate found in those alveolar spaces. You're going to not see exudate there at all in an atypical pneumonia, a walking pneumonia. It's going to come on more insidiously. It's going to come on slower, and it's going to progress over time, which is why it can do a lot more damage, hidden damage to the tissues. Um, but it tends to be confined to certain components of the actual alveolar wall and the lungs. That's which is why you're not having this huge systemic inflammatory response or immune system response like you would in a normal pneumonia state. So the key here was to recognize atypical pneumonia, walking pneumonia, less likely symptomatic, therefore you're not going to see exudate. Yeah. What are, yeah, good, good question here. I will show PICTA. They kind of are deposited. Let me see if I can get this picture up. This will be easier. But they're made up of dead cells, surfactant, proteins, and they deposit along walls of the, the um, alveoli where gas exchange occurs. And they make gas exchange essentially more difficult. Let me pull up this picture. Can you not, you can't see this picture. Okay. I forget what you can see and not see on my screen. So sorry. Oh, come on. There we go. So let me see if this, so normal alveola on the left, injured alveola on the right, and the hyaline, let me see where it is. Hyaline membrane is here. So it's this thickened inflammatory membrane composed of a bunch of dead cells, essentially dead cells, surfactant, and junk that makes per gas exchange more difficult in these alveolar tissues. So in this alveolar state, it's going to have a thickened kind of wall that's a hyaline membrane. It has just a bunch of like immune system garbage. And so it makes it harder for perfusion and transfer of carbon and dioxide. There, it's present in atypical and typical pneumonia. Yes, it's going to happen in both, so both atypical and typical pneumonia. You can see a decreased oxygenation, a decreased pulse ox. You can see decreased ability to do adequate tissue perfusion. And oftentimes that's one of the first signs that you'll see in a patient that they have a walking pneumonia as their resting pulse ox or their pulse ox with movement decreases more than a healthy normal person. Absolutely could be seen, yes. Any state that's gonna cause um, an increased amount of tissue debris or um, an increased amount of dead cells or sloughing cells, so end stage COPD or even potentially um, a fibrotic condition where we're gonna see uh, increased kind of cell buildup in those membranes could lead to a hyaline membrane present that decreases that transference of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Absolutely. Okay, let me see if I can successfully move this off the screen. Okay, learning. All right. So the big thing here was understanding atypical is walking pneumonia and recognizing it's not gonna show your typical symptoms that you would see in a normal bacterial pneumonia. So then we have an anatomy question in the lungs, the blank branch from the terminal, bron terminal bronchioles. So this was understanding the order of anatomy in the lungs. So you're gonna start with your trachea, move to your primary bronchi, then your secondary bronchi, then your tertiary or segmental bronchi, then your bronchioles, and then your terminal bronchioles, then your respiratory bronchioles, and then your alveoli. So understanding that after terminal bronchioles, you're going to have your respiratory bronchioles before you get to your alveoli. So that's just knowing that anatomical structure and the path it goes through. I think about this as knowing the, um, the flow of blood through the heart, right? We know that the blood comes through our superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium and passes through yada, yada, yada. Same thing here, just commit this one kind of to memory, make a schema that works for you, draw a little picture, whatever, whatever helps commit it to your brain. And then you'll never miss these questions. In an outpatient setting, what are the two most common bacterial causes of community acquired pneumonia? So now this is normal pneumonia. Um, pneumonia. They give you mycoplasma, chlamydia, haemophilus, streptococcus, and I think those are the those are your four. 
So it's really combining what are going to be the two most common of community acquired pneumonia. We know strep pneumonia is one. So, or if you don't, you should know. So strep pneumonia is one of the most common causes of bacterial community acquired pneumonia. So that gives us B and it gives us D. We take out A and C. We also could see that A and C have chlamydia pneumonia, which I have not seen as a common cause of community acquired pneumonia. Uh, we think of other chlamydial conditions that don't require, they don't involve the lungs. So I'd remove A and C as my answers just because that doesn't make clinical sense to me based on what I know. And if I don't know it, either it's something brand new and I wasn't going to know it anyways, or it's probably wrong. It's probably trying to lead me astray, right? So if I don't know it, I'm going to get rid of it. So I have streptococcus pneumonia and on both of these, and then I'm deciding between H flu and mycoplasma. And so mycoplasma is the answer. It's more common than H flu just by one. So if you're going in common etiologies of community acquired, it's strep pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia, then H flu and haemophilus influenza, and then uh, clostridium, I believe, pneumonia is what that is, C pneumonia, or cryptococcus pneumonia. I'd have to look, let me see, C pneumonia. Chlamydia, oh, then chlamydia pneumonia. Who would have known? Not me. I'm not sure if I believe that. Um, but I would do strep. I would do strep pneumonia is one, mycoplasma is number two, and H flu is number three. Uh, so that was just tricky. They just really wanted you to know. I have seen more mycoplasma pneumonia before than I've seen H flu. So I would probably go with mycoplasma, trusting my gut. Um, but that's their reason, their reasoning why. Hospital acquired pneumonia, different bug. Right, so if we're going to talk about hospital acquired pneumonia, um, our causative agents are going to be more likely Pseudomonas agrinosa as being one of your big bads, Staph aureus, and Klebsiella. So if you're looking at hospital acquired pneumonia, your bugs completely change. You're going to do again Pseudomonas agrinosa, Staph aureus, and Klebsiella pneumonia. Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, and Klebsiella. And Klebsiella, it's Klebsiella pneumo, and it's Pseudomonas A-E-U-R agronosa, I believe. That's how it's spelled. Nosocomial meal infections, yes, correct. They also could go under the category of iatrogenic doctor cause. Although nosocomial would probably be what they've used, but I've seen them call it atrogenic before. More commonly with the staph aureus, because that one's typically acquired from non-washed doctor's coats and you know surfaces that aren't adequately wiped and things like that. And you can get the methyl um, resistant staff as pneumonia in a hospital acquired. So I remember hospital acquired as um, pseudo staff. You could, I guess you could do like a, you could come up with some acronym for yourself. I don't know, purple people eater or something, come up with something fun. I used to have all those acronyms in my brain, but, or mnemonics or whatever. Okay, now we have phimosis. I feel like phimosis. These type of conditions come up fairly often um, on the NPLEX. They like asking male anatomy and male pathology questions. Um, so a four-year-old boy with phimosis, his son could not retract the foreskin off the head of his penis. You have now what that is. If you didn't know, there's no inflammation, pain, or difficulty urinary, urinating associated with this phimo phimosis. And his son said, it's always been this way. Okay. So is there any treatment that's needed in this situation? Your answer is, if it likely signals he has an infection, you might need antibiotics, or no treatment's warranted, it's a physiologic state, or immediate circumcision warranted to conduct this dangerous disease, or to prevent it from getting worse, throw some steroids on it. That sounds like a typical doctor. Throw some steroids at it, throw an antibiotic. So really for this, if you know what phimosis is, you know that it's fine and it's not a condition that needs immediate treatment unless if there was signs of infection or inflammation or loss of blood, right, to the area, tissue necrosis. And we're not seeing any of these signs at all. They mentioned no inflammation, no pain, no trouble with urination. 
So the answer is B, no treatment warranted is a physiologic state. Now, the difference is obviously if they had provided different um, clinical history, if they said that he's having pain with urination or anuria, not able to urinate, um, or if there's swelling or if there's tissue discoloration, then that would be a different conversation. And then you might need immediate treatment. Um, but really the crux of this is they want you to recognize that this is a normal physiologic state unless if it develops into a complication, right? Yeah. Um, it can, so you can, it's a, typically foreskin necrosis happens for a patient who had phimosis and then um, does self circumcision. And you can see tissue necrosis, that's the most common cause of um, foreskin necrosis after, with from phimosis is actually from self harm. We're trying to self correct the issue. You can see glands penis necrosis um, following paraphimosis, but this is, there's not um, the main condition you'd need to know is phimosis, so not a specific name for necrosis or um, tissue gangrene of the area. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, so phimosis, phimosis would be the only medical indication for circumcision because the foreskin is stuck over the head of the penis. It's not able to be retracted. But if, so that medically then would lead to a need to get um, circumcision at some point. But if it's not causing any actual pathologic issue at that time, you don't need to get circumcision at that moment if it's always been that way. But yes, it's the only medical condition that could actually lead to a reason for us to have to do medical circumcision versus elective circumcision, which is people choosing to get circumcised for cosmetic reasons. Yeah, yes. Yes. Retracted. Yeah. And it's up here too. So it typically will start to retract after seven. So yeah, no, this is totally. So after seven, it'll start retracting. So then if you're in adolescence and you haven't had it fully retracted, then you would consider doing circumcision as your treatment. But as a little, little, no need, because it hasn't started its natural physiologic tract of retracting. And it's not causing any complications. So thank you, perfect, absolutely. over 15 yes then it you would consider it as a pathologic condition which is why it's con it's listed in your pathologies but it's normal physiology until it gets to the age of seven or older if it doesn't start self-retracting yep 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 but premature forcing it to retract can actually cause scar tissueing and worsen its prognosis and then make you actually have to um get circumcision as a treatment later on in life so you don't want to Essentially, as long as there's no infection, no tissue necrosis as a kiddo, you leave it alone until they're older. Yeah. Then they ask a question about routine neonatal circumcision. And so really the, the key to this here is um, recognizing which ones are true, which statement is essentially true and which one's false. So what's the most true statement here, okay? It is debunked, absolutely. And so you can absolutely, it will be on your test, 100%, yes. Yeah, I love the debunked, like, should be on there. So though it reduces urinary tract infection incidence, the number needed to treat is 100. So that's the question, that's the right one. So we'll just keep going here for a second and then we'll come back. The next answer is it reduces urinary tract infection incidence a huge amount, thus it's always recommended. So that one, if I had to choose between the two, I'm like, okay, well, B sounds more extreme and less true than A. This also has huge in it, which seems very like casual language for an exam. Um, it is unknown if it affects the incidence of urinary tract infections. That to me seems like the best answer because it's the correct answer, but um, it does not prevent urinary tract infection incidence, actually increases it. We know that that's not true. So we can get rid of B and D easily. I would say C is the answer that has, is correct, truly correct. Um, but A, they are using this number, they're saying, well, 
there is this maybe association that we've now been disproven, but the numbers needed to treat is so just hot, so high. That's how we've disproved it as being actually helpful because you need to circumcise so many people to see benefit that we don't consider that then being a true benefit, right? But since they put in that number needed to treat, that's their correct answer. Is it a good question? No. Is it a good answer? No. What I hope it's thrown out, I hope, um, but that's how they got there. What is actually true, what we know now about that pathology and physiology is C. It is unknown, well actually, it's not necessarily unknown. We don't, we know that it does not increase the incidence of UTIs. And so this statement has been debunked. Yeah. This, this is in the bank, absolutely. Yes. And it could, and they might keep this as the answer or they might change it to this one, which would be the correct answer. But again, you don't, you can't get into the mind of when this question was written and if they've adequately combed it and adjusted the answer correctly. By choosing this as your correct answer, that would be correct in my mind. So this is what you should choose. This is what they previously read, wrote the question to be as true. Yeah. Yeah. Multiple times. I was like, well, this is great. And then there was like some new stuff. I was like, this is horrible. But yeah, I would say probably like a good 25% of my questions I did practice exams on came on my test. And then there was probably another 25% that were maybe related to some practice questions I did. So half the exam I'd kind of seen before in some way, shape or form, not identical, but enough that I was able to like be like, oh yeah, I asked questions about this cycle. They just asked me different things or they worded the question differently. Kind of like what we've been doing, rewording some of the questions, like saying you could ask it also this way. Um, so doing practice tests and questions, they, they recycle stuff if they like them. I did everything. I did. I've, I've sampled it all. Sampled the whole platter. Um, Wild Brilliance. I did Board Vitals. I did Task MPEX. Um, I'm being recorded. But uh, I did, what else? I don't know. Our own. I did like some of my, our own like questions that we came up with. There was like some old TIS banks. I did, I did a bunch of stuff. Was it all helpful? 100% not. I think Board Vi or um, Wild Brilliance is probably the closest to what it feels like NPLEX questions. Um, Board Vitals, I liked just because it was an easy online system that I could go through really fast. So I liked it for that reason. Um, and past NPLEX was too simplistic for me. So for me, I did really well on past NPLEX questions. And then I had like a rude awakening when I'd go do the others. So that's why I didn't like past NPLEX as much. Um, but if I was feeling bad about myself that day, I'd do some past NPLEX questions. And I was like, okay, I know things. Um, okay, failure of normal formation of foreskin leads to a hooded prepus and what other developmental abnormalities? This is knowing the difference between epispadius, extrophy of bladder, hypospadius, and dysphalia. So hypospadius occurs when there's improper formation of the foreskin, that's its actual definition, and there's incomplete canalization of the penile urethra. The abnormal preface appears in this hooded incomplete matter. So it is literally the definition of hypospadias is what they gave you there. So that's why when studying pathology, my first thing for you all is at least know the definitions of each of the pathology conditions. From there, you can get more into the weeds, right? So, but if you at least know what the pathologies mean, a one sentence definition, you're gonna be in good straits when it comes to pathology questions on your NPLEX. Uh, in this issue, circumcision is contraindicated. All right, which of, which of the following tissues are present in the foreskin? So in some anatomy, male anatomy, this is like all of my MPLEX is male anatomy. Um, tissues, all of the above. So the foreskin contains skin, nerves, and smooth muscle tissue, which makes sense. Uh, you can kind of logically think about that type of tissue and that skin there and be like, okay, yeah, it makes sense it has skin tissue, it makes sense it has sensation, and it makes sense it's gonna be able to have some movement, some motility tissue, so smooth muscle. All right, almost there, y'all. Doing good. I know this is a lot, but I hope it's helpful. 42 year old, and then we have MSK today, which is actually short and sweet. So, 42 year old Native American woman with kidney failure, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, lots of stereotypes in this one. Basal cell carcinoma of the face, is and she also has advanced renal failure and is going to be on dialysis. Hemoglobin of nine, 
Schematic rate of 28%. They tell you that those are very low numbers if you don't know them. RBCs are normal though, so it's normocytic anemia. So what's normocytic anemia is most commonly associated with what? Chronic disease, yeah, there's other things too, right? But when you hear normocytic anemia, I want you to think of anemia of chronic disease. Just like when I said microcytic anemia, think iron deficiency. Macrocytic anemia, think B12. There Are there other causes? Yes, but those are your big associations. I always want you to come just right to your brain. And then white cells and platelets were normal. So then we get some kidney questions. So which of the following cells line the proximal convoluted tubules? Do we have juxtaglomerular cells? No, those are going to be in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, right? Those are going to be before we get to those you know, convoluted tubules. So then we have simple cuboidal, complex cuboidal, and simple squamous. What do we know about squamous epithelium? Pretty thin, right? It's that flat, kind of almost scale-like appearance. So what we know about kidney tubules is we know that they have to have lots of stuff inside to be able to absorb different things and excrete different things. So there needs to be room. So it doesn't make sense to allow a squamous epithelium to line the tubules. It doesn't give enough space for us to take in nutrients and push out nutrients. So some type of cuboidal epithelium is going to be your likely guess. And when in doubt, simple, epi simple cuboidal epithelium or simple columnar epithelium most commonly line those tubular or lumen spaces. So when in doubt, a simple cuboidal or simple columnar is going to be your best bet. And in this case, it's a simple cuboidal epithelium. Sorry? Yes, correct. GI would be simple columnar versus kidney simple cuboidal. Now, part of the loop of Henle does have a simple squamous epithelium, so that is something to keep in mind. But remember, the loop of Henle, there's one part that only involves water. The thin part of the loop of Henle just involves water absorption. That's the part that's going to have your simple squamous. Every other part is going to go back to your simple cuboidal. Okay. Every other part. So what's most likely causing her kidney failure? This one I think should be another like, oh good, yes, I know. Because it says none of the above, unlikely. Diabetes, yes. Basal cell carcinoma of the face, wrong. And her ethnicity, definitely wrong. So type two diabetes is by far the best answer for this question. It's really the only answer for this question. If, she didn't, if they didn't list type two diabetes, I would pick A. None of these is likely the cause. So then they asked some anatomy. Which of the following accurately describes an anatomical relationship? So this is knowing some anatomy of adrenal glands and kidneys or aorta and kidneys, right? So they talk, they ask about, are the adrenal glands superior lateral or just superior to the kidneys? And the adrenal glands are superior to the kidneys. They're found immediately above kidneys. The aorta, they say, is it lateral to the kidneys? No, the aorta is in the middle compared to the kidneys. And is the aorta inferior to the kidneys? No, it's much on the same level. It's gonna, it's, the abdominal aorta is gonna flow up and go into the heart, and then kidneys are gonna be kind of right here on retroperitoneally. So your best answer is adrenal glands are superior. You did need to know then that they're not superior lateral, right? That was the thing you need to figure out. And then they asked a nutrient question, which I said would come up. So they wanna know, which of the following is most likely to result from renal failure? Are you gonna get high potassium, low potassium, low sodium, or high sodium? So when we think about advanced renal failure, there we go, great. Um, hyperkalemia is by far going to be the most common new, or electrolyte malignancy or electrolyte problem that we will see. And why is that? Why would we see high hyperkalemia, elevated potassium? Where does potassium typically get reabsorbed? Where? Proximal, does proximal, it does some, it does some proximal convoluted tubule, it does some distal convoluted tubule, absolutely. So those are the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules are those big places where it's gonna be reabsorbed. So it's going to be or reabsorbed or secreted. So when we typically think about, when, we, when I want you to think about chronic kidney disease, I want you to think about or chronic kidney failure, everything in the kidney is working less effectively. Your blood flow into the kidney is gonna be less. Your filtration initially in the basement membrane is gonna be worse. And then each layer of your tubule system is gonna not do its job as effectively. 
So it can affect everything. You can have high potassium and you can get low sodium. So you can get both of those issues. You can have everything in reverse. By far, which one is the body more sensitive to? Potassium. So if you had to choose an electrolyte that the body's going to be affected more by, potassium is gonna be your choice because your body can deal with a larger level of sodium increase and decrease throughout your day than it can potassium. Potassium, even small increases or decreases can directly affect heart tissue, muscular contractility, nervous tissue. So when we start seeing hyperkalemia happen in chronic kidney disease, that's gonna be our largest effector that's going to affect kind of the rest of the downstream effects of the body. But if they asked, what could you see period, or if they, if they gave you two options, I could see another great test question being like hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, hyperkalemia and hypernatremia, right? Where they list those different options there. You're looking for high potassium and low sodium in chronic kidney disease, okay? The opposite of what you'd normally want in theory. Um, I mean, neither of them are what you would want, but uh, opposite effects of what the kidney should do. Then we get some vitamin D metabolism stuff. We've learned more about vitamin D metabolism than when I was in school. So I wouldn't be shocked if we had more vitamin D metabolism questions on your NPLEX. Um, we maybe had one. It was like, what organs involved? Thanks. Uh, so what enzyme in the kidneys handles the main steps? What enzyme in the kidneys handles the main step it carries out in the vitamin D metabolism? What a terrible question. Okay. So what's the main enzyme that's involved in vitamin D metabolism in the kidneys? So is it 24 hydroxylase, 25 hydroxylase, one alpha hydroxylase or vitamin D monohydrase? Well, one is like, one is not like the other. So we can get rid of vitamin D monohydrase, which it doesn't exist. So that's good to know. Um, and so then we're left with our 24, 25 and one alpha. One alpha hydroxylase is located in the proximal tubules of the kidneys and it converts 25 hydroxy D3 to 1A25 hydroxy 2D3. So essentially calcitriol. So it's going to be the main enzyme that's going to convert that vitamin D form, the one that we test for, into then calcitriol, which has direct effects on the bone in the body. So that's why this is an enzyme of importance because it's directly involved in taking vitamin D and utilizing it for our bone formation. This enzyme can be found and it does exist in other tissues though. Um, so it's not just in the kidneys, but typically this is used the most in kidney metabolism. So while it's created elsewhere, so it's not only in the kidney, the kidney is the primary actor action place of this enzyme. 25 hydroxylase is found in the liver and it converts vitamin D to 25 oxide or 25 hydroxy D. So that is an enzyme that's important, uh, 25 hydroxylase. So our second answer B, but it's in the liver, not the kidney. So that was the key there. And then 24 hydroxylase inactivates calcitriol. So these all do exist but the one that's involved with the kidney, probably the most important enzyme, if you're gonna remember one with vitamin D synthesis, it'd be the one alpha hydroxylase. That's gonna take our vitamin D and it's gonna turn it into calcitriol in the body. So then what is the role of the kidneys with vitamin D in the body? Well, we kind of already talked about it. So if you knew the previous question, you could get this answer. So it converts 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, which is calcitriol, getting us to calcitriol. Uh, vitamin D3 to 25 hydroxy, that happens, so this one happens in the liver. This is the opposite direction here. And this is the opposite direction here of what's normal. So D and D were opposites. A happens in liver, B happens in kidney. So then we have this, what is the most likely cause of her anemia? And I told you, when you see a microcytic anemia, I want you to think iron deficiency, but we saw this as a normal, normocytic anemia, right? So we saw low hematocrit, low hemoglobin, and then normal blood cells, normal size and shape. So they're asking, okay, well, so what's the most likely cause? Is it hemolytic? Is it iron deficiency? Is it erythropoietin deficiency or acute bleeding? 
She has no signs of acute blood loss, so we would get rid of that one. And she's not microcytic, so you get rid of iron deficiency and you have hemolytic or erythropoietin deficiency. Then you're, then you're left to know what happens in chronic kidney disease with some of these processes. So as your kidneys fail, you lose the endocrine functioning of the kidney, right? Everything goes to shit essentially in the kidney. You don't have anything that's working effectively. One of your endocrine functions is erythropoietin production, which when you have decreased erythropoietin production, you have a normocytic, normochromic anemia. So that's why that's the answer there. Again, I want you to think anemia of chronic disease when you hear normocytic, normochromic anemia, but when the kidneys fail, your endocrine function, all your functions of that organ decrease, and erythropoietin production is the main endocrine function of the kidney. One of these things that if you know, you know, right? If you don't, you don't, and that's okay. You're not going to know everything on the NPLEX, but you're going to know some of it. Okay, that's it with our test. So we have an hour. We have not break for a while, so I want us to take a break for a minute just so you can, I know we want to power through MSK, but MSK is boring. Let's be real. We're going to do a little path with MSK. I'm going to tell you how I would suggest studying for our origin, insertion, action, innervation, whatever. Um, and then that will be today. So we'll do a little path and a little study support. And then I've posted all of your actions, origins, insertions, and innervations online. So you have access to all those for all the muscles. Um, so if you don't have a study resource already, you can use those slides. So we'll come back and take five to 10 minutes. I will probably start in five minutes, but if you need longer, go for it. And then we'll go through a little bit of MSK path and I'll talk about how to study for the physiology of the MSK system. And those of you hanging with me online, we're gonna take a five minute break. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we'll go into our MSK portion for the last hour of the day. <laughs> 